great, guys, we can start. This is so exciting. We've solved video chatting. Um, like my usual sound man is on holiday, so it's... Uh, yeah, so. you know, usually Edwin doesn't do his own sound, but today... Uh, no, like my roadies yeah. are... Yeah, because of lockdown, he had to, you know, give them some distance at this hour. Um, cool. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to PL Talk. Um, as you might know, this is a weekly live stream that I usually do with Hong Yi Hu, who's a security engineer at Figma. Today is just me because Hong Yi is busy doing security off somewhere. Um, I am Jean. I am uh, a programming languages person in that I did my PhD and then I was a professor, but now I am the founder and CEO of a company called Akita Software. And we do um, things with APIs is all I'll say. Um, and then I'll direct the rest of my attention to um, our special guest, Edwin Brady, who has done a lot of things in his life. Uh, two of the things you may best know him for are white space. Yes, that's him. And also Idris, which I really do believe is um, the hottest uh, new language in programming languages, even though it's been around like a couple of decades now, 1.5 decades. The, the first sort of hacky version was about 2008. Yeah, okay, 1.2 decades. Um, the first version that I was willing for anyone else to really try was about uh, 2012. So, um, yeah. But um, but yeah, so Edwin um, is uh, super cool, obviously. And today, um, uh, we thought we'd try a new format because people seem to love the demos and people seem to come for the demos. And you know, our motto is drama, demos, and data. But uh, demo seems to be the favorite. So we're just going to uh, have Edwin introduce himself really quickly and then jump right into demos. And then all other questions we will ask him during the demos. Um, so Edwin, do you, do you want to just say like a few sentences about how you got to this point in life and then, then demos? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I got to this point in life like, like most people do, just by sort of bumbling along and trying to have fun and doing things that I thought was a good idea. And um, by some amount of luck, I suppose, as much as, much as anything else, I've ended up as a lecturer in St. Andrews University in computer science. So that gives me this uh, fantastic opportunity to um, play around with interesting research ideas and pass those research ideas on to my students. So it's um, kind of a, you know, when we're allowed to go outside, it's a beautiful place to, uh, to live. It's a beautiful place to work. So um, yeah, that's kind of it. So um, I guess I'd say we did a bit more back then. So I uh, did graduate work in um, computer science at uh, Durham University. So I worked with James McKenna and Connor McBride, who uh, taught me a lot of the things that I've forgotten. Um, so I got involved in the earlier versions of Epigram. So I don't know if, um, I don't know if people in the, uh, in the audience have, have remember anything about Epigram. So Epigram was an early experiment in, uh, we called it uh, practical programming with inductive families. So essentially trying to make dependently typed programming practical and uh, kind of moved on from there. And one thing I found quite entertaining in the time that I've been doing this is how the meaning of the word practical has, uh, has evolved. <laughs> to the, that's that's very true. It anymore, if it even means anything. But um, I think we always took it to mean, you know, something just a little bit closer to actual industrial practice than, than we were. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I got here. Um, now, what I do is I like to have fun with programming languages. So, there you go. Cool, thanks, Edwin. And for everyone who um, is wondering uh, why Idris is such a big deal, uh, the context is it's I am it's an experiment in practical or usable programming with dependent types. Yeah, and. Yeah. Um, at, Edwin's going to explain all about what a dependent type is, but you know it's it's really the the next the, the cutting edge of uh, what you might see of types in mainstream programming languages 20, 30 years from now. Yeah, so I guess I should uh, share my screen. I wish there it is. Uh, Edwin, someone just said in the chat, practical as a direction rather than a state. I thought that was a, a good comment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's like um, so. You before we started streaming, you were talking about going hiking. It's like when you go hiking, uh, the top of the hill is always just round the next corner, 
<laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, so I'm glad you said usable. So, um, so, so usable programming with dependent types, because uh, one thing that I've really since the beginning of working on uh, on this sort of um, topic is I want to make these cool ideas accessible by other people. Um, I, mean, I want to make them accessible by me to start with. Um, but, but you know, once you've found out something cool, once you have a once you have a toy that you, you you're pleased with, you always want to show it to other people, and you always want to get other people to use it. And that that involves a lot of thinking about just what the ergonomics are. And I'm certainly not going to claim that we've um, figured that one out. But but if there's if there's decisions to be made about if there's design choices in the language to make, it's like what is the thing that is the usable thing to do. And um, I'm sure people will. Uh, will shout at me when I get that wrong, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, and I think one thing that I um, have uh, consistently heard about Idris is the design decisions you've made uh, around how to how to set up the language and how to set up the types are um, are quite ergonomically friendly. Yeah, um, and it's it's partly about saving myself typing, I suppose, and uh, trying to let, let's say that it's it's about trying to. Like you, you, you have a when you start writing a program, you probably have some idea in your head about what the program is supposed to do, and it's you know, trying to minimise the amount of effort to get to the program on the page, on on the on in the editor, on the machine, and be confident that it's doing the thing that you thought it was going to do. So I, I guess if there is a, a way of saying what the goal is, I guess I guess that's it. Um, so I guess um. I guess a place to start. I've got this little um, example up here, and if um, if you're a Haskell programmer, this probably looks almost familiar to you. And uh, maybe the only the only distinction being it, you know, I can I can convert this into a Haskell program by <laughs> doing it, doing things like that. Um, so I'm not going to start with with an example with dependent types, but I'm going to show you how um, I like to call them first class types. So how types of the language feature make some things um, just work out, out of the box. So um, I usually ask for a show of hands, uh, how many people have a, a background in functional programming or, or consider themselves uh, functional programmers one way or another, just because. Um, uh... Oh, yeah, I, uh, I've been asking for some other shows of hands. And so um, someone just said here, so maybe you can say if you're a Haskeller, functional programmer, or not functional programmer, not Haskeller, just tell us who you are <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> Worth mentioning at this point, some, there seems to be uh, among some people, the, 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 they seem to feel that Haskell and functional programming are somehow the same thing, and they're very much not. Uh, you know, if it's not Haskell, it's not functional programming. All I mean by functional programming, the only thing uh, that, that I'm considering the distinguishing feature is that functions are a first class uh, thing in the language. So you can assign functions to variables, you can pass functions to functions, return functions, and so on. That's that's all I'm really thinking about when I talk about functional programming. So, so I'm not really expecting people to no Haskell inside out or you understand lazy evaluation inside out or higher order functions. Just know what a first class function is. And, and the reason I bring that up is that um, in Idris we have first class functions, but we also have first class types. So that is you can assign types to variables, you can pass types to functions, you can return types. And aside from the fact that, that we start with this um, type declaration, this typing judgment. So I've got, I've got a move function here that takes a pair of integers and a pair of integers and returns a pair of integers. So far from the fact that this thing left of the colon is the, the function name and this thing right of the colon is the type, other than that, there is no syntactic distinction between types and values. They are all the same. They're in the same namespace. They're in the same sort of syntactic uh, class. Um, yeah, from, from my language implementer, that makes things so much easier because everything is in the same kind of thing. And from a programmer, it means that, um, well, I, I guess the, the, the next hour or so is going to be about showing you the, uh, the power of that. So, so the reason I picked this little example is because is this will be something that's uh, hopefully familiar to anyone who's done a bit of programming. I'm, I'm just kind of moving uh, a point uh, by some uh by some distance 
And as you write a few more programs, you want to you want to make your types a bit more expressive. You want your types to say something about what the programs are. So you'd like to define maybe a synonym that says uh, int comma int is a point. Um, so, so in Idris, we don't have a built-in way of doing that, but we do have first-class types. So I could write um, a type level function. I'm just going to call it point. And it's a function that returns a type, and the type is a pair of integers. So I can just go through changing it. Okay. So when I talk about first-class types, when we talk about dependent types, that is literally all I mean that you can write functions that return types and anywhere in the program where you might have a type, that's where you can use those programs. So literally all it means. Um, that's a literal literally, in fact. That's, that's not even a figurative literally. That's a, that's a literal literally. Um, okay, so that's, um, we'll, we'll see a bit more of that. We'll be writing functions at the type level, but if you understand type synonyms, if you, under, if you understand aliasing types, you're kind of halfway to knowing um, what a first class type is all about. But the other thing that I, I want to show before we get into any of the kind of more fancier types demos is this idea of um, type driven development. So uh, I think if you're, if you're going to design a new language, and I'm not going to say I was thinking this right at the start, but I think if you're going to design a new language and, and really push it as something that people want to take seriously. You, I think you have to have something new to say about some aspect of programming, you know, whether it's um, so Rust, for example, it's uh, oh, let's have memory safety without a garbage collector, for example, so the new thing that you're going to push. So the new thing that I want to push with Idris, a new thing, it's not actually a new thing. <laughs> um, uh, the thing I want to push with Idris is this idea of type-driven development. So by analogy with test-driven development, so test-driven development, you write your tests up front, and then you come up with a program that satisfies those tests. And you know if it doesn't, so if the tests are maybe not precise enough or not strong enough, you'll write more tests or you write more functionality. So type-driven development is a similar sort of thing, except we give the types up front. So we start with the type and we refine the program towards the complete program. And I'm going to start with, again, an example that doesn't use dependent types in any particularly deep way, um, just to show you the, the, the process, to show you what happens when you're writing a program. So I've, uh, uh, I'm doing this in, in my favorite uh, text editor. I'm hooked up to um, Idris, so the text editor can talk to uh, an Idris process. Um, so I can ask that process questions. Um, and you can think of it like, uh, programming being like a conversation with the machine. So the machine lo knows lots of things about the internals of your program. You know lots of things about your intent for that program. So the process of programming is getting you know, yourself and the machine to agree on what that program is supposed to be. And the machine knows all sorts of details about your program, possibly some that you haven't really thought of yourself. And I think it's very sad if a compiler knows all of these details but there's no way of getting at the information. So being hooked up to the, uh, the language allows us to ask it questions. So, um, or not only ask it questions, but get it to do a bit of the programming process itself. So here, I'm just gonna write a function that you can possibly guess from the name rep, for rep short for repeat. The only reason I haven't called it repeat is that uh, I think it's called that in the library. So in that is um, a natural number, so zero or more. Tie is just, some um, um, some uh, pra uh, parametric uh, type, and we're going to return a list of, the, of a number of copies of, of an element of a type. So we're going to reproduce a value n times, a number of times. So what I can do is say, give me a skeleton definition of that function. Give me an initial candidate definition of that function. And um, okay, so we've talked to the um, we've talked to the type checker. It's it's invented some slightly unhelpful names. I um, so we're going to re reproduce this value num times, and this this mysterious thing on the right hand side here. So I should say that uh, in Idris, like in a lot of functional languages, we define functions by um, recursive uh, recursive um, equations. So we're going to write a, a set of recursive equations that that explain what it means to re uh, reproduce a value n times. 
So this mysterious thing on the right hand side uh, is called a hoe. Um, it's a valid, syntactically valid uh, bit of Idris. It will even compile, so you can include holes in your programs that you compile. Uh, at runtime, if it encounters the hole, you'll get an error saying, you know, I encountered the hole. But it, it means you can, um, you can run your incomplete program, so you can test your incomplete programs. Because, I mean, realistically, any program you write spends most of its time in an incomplete state. And if you're trying to, if you're trying to hack around a problem, it's nice to leave gaps and uh, kind of the, the thing that you're not worrying about at the minute. So we can ask the machine about that hole. Um, and it will tell us things about the hole. It tells us that we have a, some tie is a type. I'll get back to the meaning of this mysterious zero uh, in a bit. We have a value and we have a number and we're trying to produce a, a list. So if you think of holes, um, I, have a, I have an illustration of holes right next to me. So this is, this is my favorite illustration. This is, you've been doing type theory since you were very young. You may not realize it. So, um, this is, uh, this is my uh, first theorem prover. Um, it's not actually my first theorem prover. I, I actually bought this for a job application. Uh, I, I, I did this nonsense in my job talk, and somehow they still employed me. Um, so yeah, we've got, a, we've got a device, and we've got a thing with holes, and we've got our values, and the right value goes in the right hole. So when you're programming, that is literally all you're doing. That's a figurative, literally. That's not a literal, literally. Um, right, so we've got a hole. We're going to fill in a value for that hole. Um, now, what might we do if, uh, if, if, uh, if we want to make progress on this problem, we probably have to know what the number is. So natural thing to do, I mean, there's, there's not a lot else we can do. Um, I guess we could return an empty list in all cases, but that's, you know, that's obviously not what we had in mind. So we can inspect this number. So I can, I can um, ask if I could use a menu rather than a keyboard shortcut, then the, the, the font on the menu is probably a little bit small. Um, but you see here it says this is the Idris menu, and we can click case split, uh, and we get the two possible cases. So, so we can say to the machine, hey, tell me about what possible values that argument could take. So uh, we're defining numbers in this, this unary um, form here. I uh, probably won't go into the details of why we do that, or, uh, this opens quite a can of worms. But um, suffice to say, a number can be either 0 or the successor of another number. If it's zero, then uh, we're going to return the empty list. Uh, if it's not zero, then we'll take one of those values and then we'll repeat k copies of that um, value. And I can check for that. It's always a good idea to check that your program type checks at every possible opportunity. This is part of the part of the being a conversation with the machine. So you don't, um, you know, you don't want to write a huge program and then send it off to the oracle, and then it's just going to say no because. I mean, if you if you write more than a few lines of code, I guess everyone's experience is um, is that correct? Well, no, it just never is. Um, so check that that's correct. Thankfully, it is. So type checks. So this is a program that will um, repeat. I can evaluate it. I think uh, let's have um, let's have five A's. Um, yeah. So we can we can test it. We can we can even test our programs as well as check that they uh, type check. So an interesting thing about um, this sort of function is that um, you remember I said there's there's not really much. If you look at that type, there's not an awful lot you would expect this function to do. Like we've got a number, we've got a value, and we're going to make a list. And yeah, we could return the empty list, but if we're going to use these two values, uh, we could say to the machine, "All right, what what program would you come up with, assuming you're trying to use?" the values, uh, all of the values that you've been given. And I, I'm going to try that. So generate a definition. And um, behold, it does, a, it does a bit of program synthesis. It does a bit of proof search. Um, then there is a heuristic that says, let's rule out the things that don't use enough of the inputs. And we get, uh, we get this, which I think is, is the natural thing for it to find. It's the natural um, first definition you find uh, by search. That's okay. super, super cool. Um, yeah, I was thinking we could take a moment now, Edwin, and step back uh, for you to just tell people, like, what is it? What is this magical thing they just saw? What is Idris? Um, and what um, what led you to start uh, start working on this? Right. So so this, I mean, this that, that thing I uh, I just showed you. So I'm, I'm basically doing backslash G in, in, in Vim here. Um, 
And, and essentially what I've done is I've scripted myself. I've, um, I've, I've said, you're right, what is it I'm thinking about when I'm writing a program? And how do I encode that process? And hey, maybe I'll be lucky if, um, if, if, it, if, if the search finds the thing that, that I would naturally try, then it's going to find that first program. It's going to find the, the natural program uh, to implement the thing. So I've always thought this interactive uh, editing process is, is just really neat. So, so way back when I uh, started as a graduate student, I was using um, a system uh, designed in Edinburgh called uh, Lego. So Lego is a, a theorem prover that in some ways, I suppose, was a yeah, in some ways it was a, the predecessor to what Epigram would have been in that uh, it had all these gadgets for interactive programming, interactively working towards uh, uh, proofs of programs. And so when I started uh, learning about dependent types, it was in this context of this system where I could, I could ask it to refine a problem. I could ask it to you know, give, me, give me all of the things I have to do for all of the cases of this number. And I just thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could do that in a programming language as well? You know, I'd like to. I'd like to take these lovely ideas of, of you know, the ability to to prove you know, small programs. So we just work in small programs, you know, but we, we can prove small programs correct. But what would it take to scale them off to a programming language? Like, can I can I write programs like this when I'm writing in Haskell? And uh, I don't know. It was, it was more than ten years later before I finally got around to uh, implementing that in a programming language. Um, but having seen what uh, people had done in in Agda and having seen uh, Carl McBride's early implementations of Epigram, you know, I looked at this and I thought, I really want that. That's a, that's a, it's just a, just a nice way of interacting with the machine. And and like, I want to take this so much further now because it's, um, I mean, let's, let's hypothetically, I'll, I'll, I'll stick a hole in here. I sort of imagine that, um, imagine doing this on a tablet, say. So this is not a device where you can easily type in large programs. But if you look at this hole here, there's only a small number of things could reasonably go in there. Um, so obviously the recursive call, it could be an empty list. It could be, I mean, it could be a fairly complicated uh, recursive call, but there's, there's only a small number of things it could be. And I sort of imagine, you know, waving over this or touching this hole and having some pop up that says, you know, did you mean one of these things or just some, some suggestions popping up that I could that I could drag into the thing. So even, even starting at, uh, at this point that, um, you know, I could I could have this type of a function, and then and then <laughs> Clippy comes up and says, "Oh, most people at this point like to generate a definition. You know? oh, most people at this point think it's a good idea to split on the variable." So uh, yes, yeah, so all of these originally came out of um, working with these interactive proof systems and thinking, "Wouldn't it be nice if programming languages could do this too?" Yeah, no, that's super cool. And one question that has come up um, in the chat and before today's stream is, um, what's the lay of the land uh, of, you know, where Idris lies versus Haskell? And you and I talked about a little bit of this. And also, what about the interactive the theorem provers like Hawk, Isabel, Agda? Like, how do you see uh, where Idris fits into the space? Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one, that, because and, and I see why people I want to ask that question because there's a huge amount of overlap um, between all of these systems and like Idris sort of in a way it started as me thinking hey what would happen if well I think one of the things that led to it was you know what would happen if Haskell had fun de full dependent types what would we what would we not have to worry about what features would we have to throw away what features would we have to add um, and so Haskell um, like modern Haskell is is approaching that in a rather different direction it's sort of starting with Haskell 98 how do you end up with a full dependently typed language? So adding, adding extensions to take it there sort of bit by bit. And then Idris is uh, me having the luxury of saying, right, I'm writing this language for me. I, I don't care if nobody else ever uses this language. I want to know what this language would look like if we didn't have to worry about all of that baggage. And I want to have the ability to um, make my own design decisions. So I don't want to um, kind of a bad case of, of not inventive here syndrome and, and a certain amount of being a control freak that, uh, that I just want to try stuff out without getting in other people's way or without people saying, oh, no, you can't do that to our beautiful system. So Idris has just been this um, 
uh, playground where I can uh, where I can try out that sort of thing. Um, it's ended up being quite similar in a lot of ways to uh, Agda. So Idris and Agda are often um, you know, mentioned in the same breath. Uh, Agda is certainly uh, a lot more uh, mature, been around longer, it has a lot more people working on it. But I think the sort of things people do with Agda is a bit, is a, bit of a sweeping generalization, but they tend to be more focused on like complete correctness proofs. What is, what is the type that completely characterizes this problem? that I'm working on and, and how do I make it so that this program cannot ever be wrong? Whereas with Idris, I've taken a, I guess a slightly different direction, which is how can I use the type system to just help me be a bit more confident that I've done the right thing? So I'm not, I'm not necessarily looking for um, total correctness without even really defining what I mean by total correctness, it's a fairly, fairly vague concept. I'm just looking for a way of if I have a bit more information about the problem, I should be able to give that information to the, uh, the machine. And I shouldn't have anything on the machine getting in my way of explaining that. At the same time, I shouldn't have the machine saying to me, hey, you haven't explained this enough. So I think it's, it's my job to decide what kind of information I want to give to the machine. So that's, that's really been the philosophy behind you know, how I write Idris programs and, and how the language has been designed. And I think I think when people work with that, yeah, you can absolutely write Agda that way, um, but I think people tend not to. People tend to look more for the um, full-on correctness proofs. Um, so the other systems you mentioned, you mentioned Coq and Isabel. So uh, Coq is a, so I used Coq quite a bit when I was um, a graduate student. Again, um, I struggled with it an awful lot because I was trying to use it like it was a dependently typed programming language. And yeah, that's that's hard. <laughs> language. Well, it is in in the in, in the technical sense that you can write programs with it, and they have dependent types. I cannot argue with the fact that it's a dependently typed programming language, but it's not very easy to write dependently typed programs in it. Um, just like <laughs> you mentioned, this Whitespace is a programming language, but it's not very easy to write programs in it. In fact, I have never written a white space program. <laughs> um, so, so COC has completely, I mean, COC has these different strengths. If you want to prove something um, about some kind of complex uh, uh, structure or complex program, or like if you want to prove something about a C compiler, COC is brilliant at that. COC has this huge library of industrial strength tactics Idris can't compete with that. At least they can't compete with it yet. Um, but if what you want to do is write, a, uh, you know, maybe express the relationship between the two data structures, just because you have some invariant that you want to maintain. Like um, <clears throat> one example might be you have a you have a list of things, and then you have a compressed version of that list, and you want to ensure throughout the program that the compressed version and the uncompressed version represent the same data, and that's literally all you care about. Then I keep saying literally. I, I, so I should stop doing that. <laughs> if that's all you care about, um, maybe it's a bit tricky to express that alone. Maybe maybe it, it gets in your way a little bit. Whereas in Idris, that would be a thing that we do uh, uh, fairly naturally. So, um, and the, yeah, the other system you mentioned, Isabel. I don't know an awful lot about Isabel. Um, again, it's uh, what I know about it is that it's it's really more of a theorem prover than a programming language. Uh, I do remember going to a summer school. Uh, on on types and programming and, and Isabel was one of the courses that came up. I remember I asked the instructor at one point, uh, I'd, I'd done this little proof of, I don't know, reverse of, uh, reversing a list twice gets you the original list, something like that. And, and I asked, uh, so how do I, how do I run this program? And he sort of looked at me in horror. It's like, why, why would you want to run the program? You've proved it's correct. Um, a similar thing happened, and this is probably very embarrassing, but someone was giving a talk on homotopy type theory, and this was one of the first times I, I heard about this. And I raised my hand and I said, so are these programs that you run? And then uh, no one really answered this question, but I knew that it was not, not the right <laughs> question to ask um, at the moment. Um, it's certainly but, terrible. To that. So the, the, their interest seems to be, or the interest of the sort of pioneers of this field seems to be um, uh, elsewhere, at least it was originally. I, I, I know very little about homotopy type theory, I'm afraid. 
Um, that's uh, sometimes people ask, oh, does does Idris support homotopy type theory? But, uh, maybe if you maybe if you fork it, you can. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, something I wanted to uh, ask about is the power of these holes. Um, so there was a little bit um, uh, of questions about the holes in the chat, and um, as you know, we had Nadia on. Uh, a couple of weeks ago to talk about um, program synthesis. And so I think people are wondering how powerful are these holes? How are these holes different than like uh, holes in program synthesis? Are um, they the same? Okay, let's, uh, do I have a, yeah, let's, let's, let's take a look at a, let's take a look at a, 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 an example that actually has some more interesting dependent types in. So it, it wasn't an accident that I mentioned compressed data. Uh, so um, this is this is my new favorite example um, because because it there's, it captures so much stuff in a very small amount of code. So um, so I, uh, people are familiar with uh, run length encoding. So run length compression. So essentially, you, where you've got a you know, if you're trying to compress five x's and then six y's. Then you just say, well, I have five x's, I have six y's, and that compresses it. That other compresses to x x x x x. So, so it's um, I mean, not generally a tremendously useful compression scheme, but it turns out it's a very easy one to write down the type rule. Um, so, so you've seen this uh, this rep function. I'll just generate that again, and then we've got this definition of of compressed data. So, I, I'll show you this definition of compressed data. And then we'll see, I'm going to write an uncompression function. So the uncompression function is just because it's easier than the compression function. And then we'll come back to the compression function. And on the way, we'll see, we'll see holes um, coming up. So what we can do with uh, data types in Idris is we can, we can index them by other bits of data. And one way to think of this is, is, is think of um, run length as being um, a description of some other data type. Think of it as, as, as or as having a relationship to some other data type. So run length encoded list has a relationship to some other list. So the empty run length encoded list has this direct correspondence with the empty list. And if I have a number and a value and more run length encoded data, then that is that has a direct correspondence with n copies of x followed by the rest of the run length encoded data. So this is, um, uh, I should say that this is, uh, this is intended to be a, a sound representation of run length encoded data. I'm not, I'm not trying to come up with the best possible representation. So there is no proof here that this is the best possible compression. So you can still say one X, one X, one X, and that will be equivalent to three X. So remember the thing here is about, we're using the types to help us write the program. We're not using type necessarily to, to, to make sure that the program is completely correct. So, uh, so a compression function might actually not compress at all, but at least the result is going to be sound. So it's about helping you write them. Types are there to help you write the program. They're not there to get in the way. If you find that types are getting in the way, probably a good idea to, to rethink your type. Yeah, so I've got a, got a little um, example of some run length encoded data. So the, the test compressed data is three X's followed by four Y's followed by empty. Uh, I put a question mark in the type here. So a question mark means uh, I can't be bothered to write down the, the, um, the, the full list here. And surely the machine can infer it anyway. So um, partly do that. Um, I don't actually know why I have to give. I, I tested this half an hour ago. And for some reason, it wants me to write the type of the uh, elements. So I'm going to go and debug that later. But I, I partly do this because people sometimes say, when you have full dependent types, you lose type inference. And that's partly true. So you certainly have to write a, a top level type declaration everywhere, but you don't have to write everything. If there's something that the machine can figure out, then let the machine figure it out. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is, um, I'll get rid of this because it's uh, just noise. I'm gonna write this, this, this uncompression function and uh, we'll see. So this, this, this type says, I, I'm gonna take a run length encoded list of, of tie that's called X's, and I'm going to produce a list. Now, this is this is not the most precise type for this function. So, because what we really want is somehow to be sure that that this X's is going to be the the, the list that we return. So, it's actually corresponding to X's. 
So what you might imagine, so I'm just going to write a, a candidate definition for this. So I can check the type of that hole. And one of the things I have available is this list, X's, is the, uh, is the uncompressed list. So, so one thing you're seeing, when you see a hole, uh, a hole will give you a little bit more information about the program that you haven't necessarily written down yourself here. So I've, I've, so I've written down that X's is a thing and I want, to re, I want to return a list. What the machine is telling me is that, yes, X's is a thing that I know about, but there are zero of them available at runtime. And this is very good news because if that X was available at runtime, we wouldn't really have achieved much by compressing the list because we'd be carrying around uh, the original list with us. So, you know, you might say, I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to use that X's. And uh, it says, oh, sorry, it's, that's, that's, that's a bad error message, but uh, no, sorry, X's isn't accessible. So somehow um, we're going to have to do a bit of work here. Um, so the holes will, well, in this case, they're not going to tell us an awful lot. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to show you how, um, so just to demonstrate how, how little information the, the type and the holes have given, I'm going to try generating, synthesizing a definition for this. And um, it will happily synthesize the definition, but somehow it's, it, it doesn't realize that this, this N is important. So it's a, uh, when we do the, the, the synthesis, it only knows about the, the, the basic ways of constructing a data type. So it knows about cons, it knows about um, nil, and it knows about recursive calls. Uh, it also knows about deconstructing recursive calls, but it doesn't know every list function. And even if it did know every list function, well, what information have we got? Um, so I can stick holes anywhere. Holes is the, partly to answer the question, um, what is the power of holes? I think holes are really useful to understand an existing program. So I can um, I can make a hole, I can take a bit of a program I've got, put a hole in its place, and then I can learn all about the context that that uh, hole is defined in. So, so you can see here that uh, all it knows is it's, it's trying to produce something of type tie. It has a thing of type tie. So the natural thing for a program synthesis to do is use it. So, so it will use it. So uh, holes here, they're cool. telling us about the context, they're telling us uh, what we have to do. Um, but somehow we'd like to, um, we'd like to, to, to have the machine help us a bit more in writing this program. There's a bit of information that we have that we haven't passed on to the machine. So we want the results to be X's, we want it to be equal to X's. And we can, like the people that may have noticed the sort of giveaway up here, we have this uh, singleton type. So singleton is a type that has exactly one value. And the type tells you what that value is. So I can say that uh, I, I, I want to produce something. I want to produce something whose value I know at compile time to be X's, but it can't be X's. And it can't be X's because I don't have X's available at runtime. So I have to make a thing that's equal to X's but not actually that specific X's because yeah, I can't have it. Uh, I'm just going to generate this because uh, it works. So, um, so what we'll do is, is make, uh, let's give these uh, slightly better names. That's still type check. Good. Um, so, so we're going to make a recursive call to uncompress the rest of the data. So that's what we did before. But we're also going to look at what the result of that is and then um, generate the rest. Uh, let's just, uh, and again, I'll, I'll put a hole in so that we can see exactly what's going on. So we can see that we have, um, uh, we have, we have the original compressed data for X's. That's the run length encoded Y's. And we can see that we have successfully reconstructed Y's. And we can see that we are trying to produce uh, we're trying to produce a singleton of, of, of this um, of this expression here, nx is followed by y's. Um, so there is a, there is only one value of that data type, which is just the thing it says in the type. So it's generated it again. So what what we've seen here is um, well, firstly the holes telling us um, what's going on in the program, but secondly, uncompress is a program we already wrote. Like we we've written uncompress when we wrote down 
the form of the compressed data type. We, we said that uh, the uncompressed form of empty is the empty list. The uncompressed form of run is repeat NXs and then it's uh, and then recurrently call uh, more. So why should we write it again? So um, so 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 using that single type. Firstly, it's it's allowed us you know when we deconstruct the program and, and put holes in some places, it's allowed us to see what's going on. Secondly, um, the types have, have helped uh, program synthesis to guide us to the program that we actually wanted. So. Very cool. So I mean, here's a question that people often ask people who like uh, static, uh, statically check dependent types. Why spend all the effort in, in writing the type if the type is uh, you know often as long or longer than the program? What what do you love about dependent types? So I would say if your if your types are routinely longer than your programs, all you've really done is you know, you're kicking the can down the road, really, aren't you? You're uh, you have to do all the same work. Um, you're just doing it somewhere else. Where it really um, where it really becomes useful is if the type is not the program. So in this case, the type is the program. At least for uncompressed, it's the program. Um, in, in the cases where it's most useful, the types are some abstraction of the data that you're interested in. And I think, um, I think it's, um, <laughs> we didn't exactly prepare this, but it does lead to, a, it does lead to a, a, another example, which I think illustrates the idea. It's like, here we've got types, so in this run length encoding example, we've got types to help you get the, the functionality correct. So types of functional correctness. I think more interesting is types for non-functional correctors. That, that is, not does the program give the right answer, but does the program behave the right way when it's run? So mm -hmm. does it use resources correctly? Does it use the right amount of memory? Are you accessing a thing that you are allowed to access? So maybe some security properties. So the, um, so the example I've been looking at is, um, uh, imagine, a, imagine a data store, so a remote data store that you have to log into before you get the secret. And uh, that's either, it's either logged in or logged out. You're either logged in or logged out, depending on whether you've gone through a bit of the protocol that logs you in uh, successfully or not. If you're logged in, you can read the secret data. If you're not logged in, it's not going to work. Um, so we're using types to just abstract over the protocol. Well, we've just got these two protocol states, but we want to make sure that we're only running the operations when we're allowed to run the operations. So um, there's a little bit of stuff here that I don't really want to, I don't want to go into the, all the technicalities. But the things I uh, the things I should highlight are, firstly, just log out is a nice simple example. Log out, we'll assume log out always succeeds. If we're logged in and we call the log out function, we end up with a logged out store. But the other thing is uh, this mysterious one. Um, so I showed you the zero. Zero is when you have a thing that is um, erased, so you can't access at runtime. One is where you have a thing that you have to access exactly once at runtime. So this is a way of um, encoding state transitions without having to go into um, type level monadic hackery. It's, um, oh, that's really, that's really, really nice. So this is this is the I think the most interesting new thing that we've got uh, in Idris too. So this is this is built on um, Bob Atkey and Connor McBride's recent work on uh, quantitative type theory. So That's the idea really that cool. not not only not only what you can do, but when you can do it. Um, so their theory actually goes way further than what Idris has implemented. So there's uh, um, so it, it's it's the, the 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 quantities can be just some arbitrary um, semi ring um, in Idris for. Partly because I, I like this idea of um, you heard of the language strangeness budget. So this is something that uh, I remember. I think certainly Steve Kravnik's talked about it. I don't know if he came up with the concept, but the idea that if you if you come up with a new language, there is only a certain amount of weird stuff you can put in the language in one go. And, I love that. Uh, I kind of want to take this much further and have like polymorphism in quantities and all the other quantities. And I think I've already blown the strangeness budget for Idris too by adding quantities at all. So there are three numbers I'm interested in, zero, one, and don't care. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so and th these are just, you know, abstract representations of what the functions would do. You'd actually, you know, you'd expect these to be solving across the network. Um, so 
So I'll show what happens when you try to write um, an implementation of this protocol. So I haven't told you what res is all about. And this will just come up when we're writing the program. And, and hopefully, it will become clear when we're writing the program. Well, you'll also, you'll also notice, so one thing I will draw attention to, when we try to log in, um, you're not necessarily going to succeed. So you can't just write a state transition system where login takes you from logged out to logged in, because it might not work. And if you're, a, if you're a C programmer, or if you're a C programmer, anything like I write C, um, you'll just run your functions and you'll, uh, you'll blunder on and um, you'll assume that it works and, um, and, and you know, everything will go disastrously wrong at runtime. So um, yeah, part of the reason I like writing Idris is I don't get away with that sort of stuff. You know, I, it, it forces me to be honest about uh, how my programs are going to behave. You know, I am a terrible hacker. Idris keeps me honest. So I've said in the type here, we start in the logged out state. And whether we end up in the logged in or logged out state is in the machine's hand. It's not in my hands. It's, it's whether, whether the system tells me I'm in the logged in or logged out state. But we'll, we'll see how that works um, as, as we get to it. So um, the first thing we're going to do, so I never write programs in one go. I always write, um, uh, I always write it as a, a whole, and then we'll do a bit at a time. And again, I won't go into the details of what's going on with the connect here. We'll just say that we, we have one logged out store and because this is a this has to be used once, I have to spend it. So I, I have to I have to actually get rid of that thing. Otherwise, it's not going to type check. So I could just disconnect, and that would be fine. But it'd be more interesting to uh, try to log in. So what was the type of login? Login takes um, a store and a password. So what password shall we use today? Let's try this one. Um, and let's see if that type checks. That's reassuring. So we'll see now, at every stage, we'll see what we have available. Uh, we'll see what we have to do. So we see that, so this S, so this said one earlier, and it's now been spent. So I spent it by calling login. But in return, I've been given one result. And this is, well, give you a hint as to what res is, it's a pair. So it's, it's a pair of a Boolean and something that I'm going to calculate when I know what that Boolean is. So in some ways, this is like, if, if you understand what's happening in this type, you've pretty much got dependent types. It's, you have some value available at compile time. You're not going to know what it is until runtime. But if I do some kind of case analysis on that, I'm going to end up with the two branches. So I, and if then else, I'm going to end up with two branches. Inside those two branches, I now know what the, what the value is. So why doesn't the machine know that? So in a, in a kind of conventional programming language, uh, the machine should know that if, if it was paying attention. But you know, generally, it's not. Obviously, there's a, uh, uh, not obvious, but uh, there are some fancy type systems and some fancy kind of uh, flow analysis uh, that, uh, that will figure that out for you. But here, what we've done is we've encoded it, in the type, we encoded it in the type system. So when we do a compile time check on that Boolean, we will be able to carry on in the knowledge of what that Boolean is. Um, however, first, we have to figure out how to inspect that res. And you saw earlier, I had this um, interactive uh, analysis of, of an input to a function. So that works That works for intermediate values too. So I can say, uh, please give me a case block. So it's given me a case block. I just added that because you know, I'll do anything to avoid typing. And as soon as I've written a few case blocks, you know, hold on, I, they always up say. So we're going to do some case analysis on that. So now doing this case analysis, we've now spent res. But in return, we have a case file. And it's, um, let's, uh, let's look at this. So we've, we've, we've spent our res, we've got a case file. And um, I actually have an illustration of this next to me, if you will indulge me for a moment. This has been sitting here for a while. And it's, um, it's getting on for midnight. So I think it's OK for me to um, open the St. Andrew's Brewing Pale Ale. So I have one of these. And it's in a container. It's in a, it's in a case, I guess. And I have, I have another, I have a let binding. This is my let binding. And I'm going to be extra careful here, because if this goes over the keyboard, the whole stream is uh, 
I now have none of these, but I can still talk about it. So it's it's still in the context. Uh, I will garbage collect it um, after the stream, obviously. Um, but it's still in the context. I can still talk about it. I shouldn't like just because. So the, 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 in fact, this is the key thing about QTT: that the, 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 the innovation of, of quantitative type theory, that it's not really tender types, is that you can reason about things that you used to have, but you can't actually spend them again. So I'll run out of the way. And um, I don't know. I guess I'll, it's it's late. So. That's an incredible analogy. Wow, I think that's the best best explanation of that I've ever seen. Anyway, um, so we. Um, we haven't finished yet. Obviously, we have to do some work now. So uh, I'll leave I'll leave that to one side. So work. Um, so um, so we now want to look at the contents of this um, of this thing that we just created. So this is this is kind of like um, tipping the beer glass. And uh, so it tells me that it's well. What is a val hash r? So. Um, so I didn't have to look at, you know, look up the documentation for that or anything. I just said, you know, the machine knows what this is. The machine can deconstruct it for me. And then I'll look at the type of the hole to see what I have available. So, so it says, all right, well, you've got a, you've got a value um, and you've got, uh, you've got some results, but the result has been spent and we have a store and the type of the store. So we've got, this is, this is what, this is where we have, um, this is where sort of first class types and having Values in types and types and values turned out to be really nice. Is that um, you know I don't have to do any kind of type level programming. So my um, what I like to say instead of type level programming is programming. You know what's what's the difference? What why should it be different? It's the same thing. You're doing the same thing of looking at values, doing computations. It just happens that they're being done at compile time rather than runtime. So it says here I've got a program at compile time that. Once I know what this value is, it will tell me a bit more about the store. So I guess I'm now imagining a, a kind of, um, so this is, you know, we've, we've only just started this project on, on programming of a conversation and interactive programming. And um, uh, so we haven't got to the point yet where the machine says, oh, hang on, you've got, a, you've got a thing that you're going to use once here and its type is a bit complicated, but the type is referring to one of your other local variables. So it's probably a good idea to look at what that local variable is and see what happens. So this is you know, type-driven development in action again. This is type, the types tell us that I'm, I'm pointing at the screen, that's no use to you. <laughs> the types tell us that this val is a thing that we're going to have to look at. So I'm going to do that. Um, so in this first case, because that's a program at compile time, it's now going to have run that program and it's going to have refined the store to say, yep, when I've successfully logged in and you can't have the one that was logged out. And then in the second case, it's going to say, nope, it's now logged out. So, so here what we've done is we've written a very abstract program at the type level. It's basically a thing is logged out, a thing happens, and then it's logged in. So that's the abstraction of the, the state space. And then the program, we're going to work within that state space to, um, hope to do something interesting. I think that's a really, really cool example. So I, I'm just thinking that time is marching on, and I have a what really scaled up version of this, to, just to see if, I mean, I'm not going to go through the details. I just want to show you what it is. If, uh, so if, if anyone's interested in concurrent programming. Yeah, do you, um, so do people in the chat want to tell us, do you want to see the, the scaled up concurrent programming example? I'm just going to put it on the screen and then. <laughs> All right, we, cool. Uh, if someone, if, if five people say yes in the, in the next, uh, me counting to 10 in my head, then we'll do it. Okay, one person. <laughs> uh, still counting, two people. Um, I think, you know, the rate at which things are going, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> five people have said yes. <laughs> Um, I mean, this, this will only take, I mean, yeah, it'll only take a couple of minutes. So, um, so one thing that, uh, something that's very hard to test, you know, people sometimes say, well, why don't you just test your program? You'll get the same value. But concurrent programs are really hard to test because, you know, you'll, you'll test it a million times, it'll work fine, and then the million and first, it'll go wrong. Um, so it might be that, um, so for whatever reason, someone has sent the wrong type over a channel um, or, or um, something has been sent at the wrong time. So, um, so this, um, this store example, it scales up uh, reasonably neatly to um, concurrency protocols. And even better, 
we don't have to write the concurrency protocols. Um, we don't have to write. We don't have to write new functions for each concurrency protocol. We can generalize it. We can write all the protocols. So this this is um, this thing called utils. It, it is just a it's a concurrency protocol, and it says the first thing that happens is a client will request something. So it will send this command add or reverse over a channel, and then the server. So basically, request means the client sends something. Respond means the server uh, the server sends something back. So uh, the, the server will, I'll do it. if we request add, then the next thing that has to happen is the client sends a pair of ints and the server will then send back an int. And if the request is to reverse the string, then the client will send a string and the server will respond with the string. So all sorts of things could go wrong here. If you were trying to write this in, in a language that didn't allow you to encode the protocol, you are basically relying on programmers getting things right to encode that the right response is coming back, which at first is probably going to be OK. But at some point, you're going to change the protocol. So someone's going to come along with a request for a new thing or to request to add a new argument. And if you don't change every point where you use that protocol, it's going to go wrong. Now, this is something we're completely used to with calling functions and calling methods. It's just a natural thing to do. But what, what we've got here, because we have this way of um, kind of encoding uh, state transitions and this way of computing types from things that we only find out at runtime, we can write um, a type for send and receive to move the channel state along as we work through a protocol. So I'm just going to do that again with holes. So I'm, I'm glad someone asked about holes and how powerful they are earlier, because I'm going to use holes to illustrate uh, what's going on here without going into the exactly all the details of how the concurrency is set up. I'll just show you an implementation of, of uh, the client. Um, so, so the client has, has sent the add command over the channel. And so the type checker is going to tell us that the next thing we have to do. So what is the type of the channel? So the channel type is send a pair of integers and then do some more stuff. But the only thing we have to look at is send a pair of integers. So if anyone's familiar with session types, so session types are, uh, a typing discipline that uh, Kohei Honda came up with back in the, the 90s, I think, and has been refined in various directions since. So this is this is a, a way of giving types to concurrent programs, and I just think it's 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 really lovely that this this typing discipline is something we can just take and encode in an existing type system as part of an existing programming language. So we don't have to write an extension to a language. We don't have to you know, write some external tool that generates the programs for us. We just write a type level program, or as I say, a program that, that allows us to compute that type. So if I change my mind about what I want to do, you know, if, I, if I want to reverse something instead, then it will say, oh, well, now you need to send a string. And uh, uh, more interestingly, on the server. So the server doesn't get to choose what the command is. The server has to look at what the client sends. So, so we're receiving something on the channel. And uh, what went wrong? Did I? Uh, oh, yeah. I'm glad I did that. I, I like making these mistakes to show you that the program really doesn't type check when I, uh, when I do something wrong. OK, good. Um, so, so we we received the command, and what, remember in that um, store example, we had this store if b then or if val then whatever. So the hint is like, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna understand this stuff, but there is a huge hint as to what I have to do to make progress, which is that something depends on the command that I have just been sent. So perhaps we'll make some progress if I do some case analysis on that command. And I'd, I'd really like to, pro to, to teach program synthesis. So you know, we've got this program synthesis system. I'd really like to teach it that you, know, you press a button at this point, and it says, well, you probably, you're probably meaning to do a case split on that, uh, on that command. So that's what you do. And again, I'll just um, I'll, I'll replace these with holes just to show you what you see. Um, so in the case of add, it says, OK, the next thing you've got to do is receive a pair of integers. And if it's reverse, uh, the next thing you've got to do is receive a string. And the whole thing is uh, managed by this, this fork function. Um, so, so we know that the two things correspond, because the only way of invoking a client in a server is to run fork 
which will run the two processes. The two processes have to correspond because, um, well, they're working to the same protocol. So if we change one, we're going to have to change the other. Now, obviously, there's all sorts of things could go wrong here. Like, what if one of the processes crashes? What if one of them doesn't terminate? So I kind of swept that under the carpet a little bit. But under the assumption that the process has run to completion, you're going to have two corresponding processes. So I think that's, that's one really nice thing that I haven't really taken this uh, much further than this yet. But essentially, something you could do with this is um, security protocols over a network. So you know, something like a, an open SSL bug, for example, it would be nice if you could encode that sort of thing in the type system and then have uh, some additional confidence that uh, that you get the implementation. Out. And we're a long way from being able to do that, but it's, it's, it does at least feel now within the bounds of possibility that you'd be able to encode that protocol, write the whole thing in the same language and, uh, and everything would work very nicely. Um, um, cool, that's no, that's, that's awesome. Oh, sorry, what were you saying? No, I'll just say that's as far as I'll go, as I'll go on that example. Um, cool. We're already a little over time, but I think there's a question that um, I have had for a very long time, and yeah. probably many other people have, which is who are the lucky people who get to use Idris in industry? What do they use Idris for? Anybody can use Idris in industry. I'm not, uh, well, okay. <laughs> I was going to say I'm not picky, but there's certain people I'd rather not use Idris, Idris in industry, but let's not go there. Um, so. Occasionally, I hear it from people who say, oh, I use Idris for this little thing on the side in my company, or I use Idris for this. I'm like, why don't you tell me these things? I love to hear about these things. So even if it's not a core part of, of some business, then I'm delighted to hear about it. So there is one that I know about that I have to be pretty vague about because it's um, so it's an, uh, a company that I've been working with. So I'm going to be super vague here. Um, so you know, for all you know, I might be making this up. Um, <laughs> In, in protocol correctness. They're interested. Okay, Basically, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, so they, they want to they want to get some data from one place to another. It's sensitive data. They want to aggregate data from various different sites, but you can't just do that because um, you, you can't have the data leak and it has to be it has to be kind of intact when it gets there. So what they're using Idris for is exactly this uh, linear typing of, of protocols and I'm basically on the side giving them a bit of advice. And, and they're, they're, they're my guinea pigs for uh, for Idris too. So they're- Well, that uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Hillel says he knows a couple of people using it in production, but they're afraid to tell you because they're okay. worried you'll be mad for using Idris but, too. They didn't tell me that because that would terrify me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, I'm using Idris in production, but I'm using it to implement itself. And that's not really, that, that doesn't convince anybody. It's, uh, I mean- it's I think it's of, very cool. It, it's cool, but it's just like, yeah, great. It implements itself. What are you going to do next? Implement itself in itself in itself. <laughs> um, well, well, I think we're we're running to the end of time because because some people are dropping off. So, do you have any final hopes or dreams you want to talk about? Anything you want uh, the the viewers to help you with um, to do an address? Yeah. Um, I mean, I <laughs> my. We're in this very fortunate position that, that, that I'm just allowed to have fun with uh, the stuff I'm working on. My, my employer largely lets me, you know, as, as long as I show up and teach the classes and, and as, long as, as long as I get the odd publication out and you know, bring in a bit of grant funding once in a while, they're pretty much happy for me to, to carry on implementing it, which means that I'm lucky. I'm driven by what I'm finding the most entertaining to do, you know fun driven development got to be a good that's great so the thing that's fun at the minute that's actually partly inspired by um by the, uh, the, the by nadia's um pl talk a couple of weeks ago was uh, you know she was showing these really cool program synthesis things and i thought i've got to make my program synthesis able to do this because that is <laughs> um particularly when it becomes a conversation so then that's that's the thing i'm excited about at the moment is is how do i <laughs> how do i implement myself how, how do I script myself in such a way that I can, that I can get on with the fun bits of my job and leave the boring bits of my job to um, uh, to, to the machine? So I got it to generate uh, the, some things in the continuation monad the other day, and that was that was so satisfying because that's really cool. Generating things that I don't know how to implement by hand or I find hard by hand, and that's, that's really lovely when it does that sort of thing. So that's one thing. So another part of your question is, you know. What do, what do I want other people to do? And, and it literally just have a play, just 
pick your favorite program or pick your favorite thing that you like to work on, have a go at implementing it, chances are you will run into um, missing library support. So that's just the way it is. It's a, it's a, at the end of the day, it's a research toy. You know, I don't have Mozilla behind it or I don't have Google or Apple or whatever behind, uh, behind it. So there's, there's me and I have a postdoc who's uh, working on it, the Guillaume Malay. So that's, uh, and I'm, you know, I have uh, PhD students coming in. But it's only like two or three of us, and, and it can't really be a full-time job. So you can't expect the whole library ecosystem to come from us in St. Andrews. So if you come across something that you want to be able to write but can't because of lack of library support, don't just storm off in disgust. Have a crack at writing that library because it's the people who need the libraries who are going to do a better job of writing those libraries. So, um, yeah, no, the, the other part of your question is, you know, what are my hopes? Well, I want people to steal my ideas. You know, I, as I say, I'm not Apple, I'm not Google, Mozilla, or you know, even a smaller company with resources uh, behind them. So it would be great if a company who did have those resources would steal our ideas and implement an industrial strength dependently type language. Now, maybe what they'll do is extend Idris, and that'd be wonderful. But um, you know, if, uh, <laughs> sometimes people have asked me, what happens to Idris? when dependent Haskell comes along. And a half joking answer to that is, well, I've won, haven't I? I don't need to do any more work on my, uh, on my compiler. It's a half joking answer, because obviously there's other, there's other differences between the two. But uh, as, as academics, we really win when people steal our ideas and use them to do um, cool stuff in other fields. So, you know, a programming language is not an end in itself. Uh, I mean, to some extent it is for me, just because it's enormous fun. But um, realistically, they're used by practitioners in other fields. They're used by software developers. So, so if people take the things that we're working on and use them on a real system, that will make me very happy. And, and even the fact that there's a couple of users using it for some small things, uh, that, that makes me very happy. So. Um, great. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's, a, that's such a such a poetic way to end. Um, thank you. Thank you, Edwin, for being on the live stream. Um, there are a ton of questions for you in the chat. So if you have time, feel free to hang out in the chat. If you don't, it's really late over there. Enjoy. It's about this long. And I, I think I think it's time to drink this. So. All right, guys. So ask your questions to Edwin uh, before he finishes his uh, his let find his let found uh, beer. <laughs> And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Edwin. This was this was amazing. There there are many quotes. I have to go back through and, and cut clips of all of them. We'll make so you into the things I say just to. <laughs> yeah, but this was uh, the demos were incredible. Yeah, thank you so much, and um, and thank you everyone for uh, for watching. Yeah, have have a good night. Enjoy. Thanks.